you a success? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you own that right there. Are you a badass? Oh, t- definitely. <laughs> Well, you know, you have to understand, I come from an entire clan of badasses. You don't take a Henderson on, you know, let me tell you. If you met my family, you would know exactly where I got it. (laughs) That is awesome. You're listening to The Other 50%, a herstory of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the show where we hold the space for the working women of Hollywood to tell their stories. In this episode, I got to speak with Ida Lee Henderson. Ida Lee is a production accountant extraordinaire. Most recently, she worked on Rizzoli and Isles. She did, I think, eight years on Brothers and Sisters. Also did a lot of feature films like Planet of the Apes, Anna and the King, and Rudy. Uh, We spent a long time talking about what her experience has been and what it is like to be a very competent and very confident woman in this business. And she said so many great things that I just wanted to tweet out to the universe as she said them. One of them being, when a sister takes a stand, stand behind her. Anyway, this is great talking to her. Have a listen. What is your job? I am a production accountant for motion pictures and television. How did you get that job? Let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> How did you get in this business? Well, I, I had many jobs and I was a bit of an entrepreneur and I... At the time I thought about it, about working in the entertainment industry, I was the controller for a company in San Diego that owned retail outlets, about 20 retail outlets in four states. So you were a real accountant before you did this? Yeah, I was a real bookkeeper. This is so funny because in the entertainment industry, they call us accountants. Yeah. But in the world of accounting, you can't be called that unless you're a CPA. So it's always been awkward for me to be called that because <laughs> I am not a CPA, and uh, but I'm really an excellent bookkeeper. Um, <laughs> so I I was this controller for this small company, and uh, it was taken over in kind of a hostile familial takeover. It was high drama for about a year. And while we were kind of wrapping things up, knowing we were going to turn everything over because we had lost the battle, I thought, you know, everybody needs bookkeepers, and I've always been attracted to the entertainment industry. You know, of course, at 17, I thought I wanted to be an actress. Didn't I we all? I was in love with Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought, you know, I'm just going to go for it. So I was uh, late 20s, early 30s, and I just decided to sell everything I owned, pack what I needed in my car, me and my cat, and came up to LA, stayed with friends, did house sitting for about a year and a half, and I just tried things on. I just tried on, you know, I had really good secretarial skills uh, from earlier days. So getting a position as an executive secretary was was kind of easy. Uh, there was a temporary agency that placed you with high-level entertainment executives. And I happened to be good Mm -hmm. with dealing with really difficult personalities, so I was a great fit for them. So I tempted, and I learned what different jobs were and what people did. And And you tempted in studios? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I worked for different producers. Uh, I worked for animators. I worked for directors on films. I just did, if your regular full-time assistant needed to take a vacation, Uh, but you can't be without somebody, they would call this gentleman and he would place one of us high-level executive secretaries in to fill in for them. And it was challenging because, you know, as you know, it's hard, the personalities and the... Oh, it's not easy. Not easy. So, but it was great for me because I got to learn what everybody did. And then one job I had, uh, I was actually there for quite a few months and... Uh, they were they they. I think it was the best job I ever had. The uh, the producer and director had been prepping in Los Angeles, and the producer had these really nice offices at what was then Orion Pictures in in uh, Century City. <laughs> Everybody starts at Orion Pictures, yes. don't they? So um, he had this prime corner office, and and a part of him was afraid if he left to go on location for three months that he would come back and they would have moved him to a less <laughs> desirable office. So he pretty much hired priorities, me priorities. to sit 
at, you know, at the secretarial desk and guard the office for the three months they were in San Antonio filming. And, and I did other things. I mean, I expedited anything that needed to be shipped out of L.A. or, you know, I, I was sort of like their, their little L.A. liaison for the film while they were filming in San Antonio. Uh, but everything came through my desk. So, you know, all the script revisions and the production reports and the budgets, everything came by me. And I just used that as an opportunity to learn, 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 learn. And I realized I could, I kind of had the basic skills that I could either be a script supervisor, a production office coordinator, or a production accountant. Mm -hmm. And um, I looked at that and I thought, okay, well, script supervisor, frankly, sounds like the most fun to me. It still does. I still For think sure. that's a cool job. Uh, but they have to be with the camera, which means that if the camera is in the middle of a snowstorm at 4 a.m. in the morning, that's where they're going to be. And I'm not that kind of gal. I'm not a rough it kind You've of gal. You really thought this through. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the production office coordinator, again, uber valuable, great position, but they're kind of like everybody's mom. Right? They right. take care of everybody and any problem. They're just there to solve problems and to get things comfortable for everybody else. And I am not a mother. I never wanted to be a mother. And I didn't want to be the mother for a bunch of adults. And do you think the production office coordinators are typically women? Typically, yes. Although I have worked with several men uh, who were who were very good, I've also I've worked with both men and women who were great, and both men and women who were not so great. Yeah. But I have uh, I have had good experiences with with both, but largely they're women. Yeah. Okay, so then you picked accounting. Yeah. So I thought, well, if I were going to do any of these, it would probably be accounting. It's kind of, you know, not as much money as a script supervisor, but more than a coordinator, <laughs> and it, you can work decent hours. You mm -hmm. can, you know. Not that, not that a 10-hour day is what most people would call decent hours. Well, but comparatively. Comparatively to being on set, you know. And these were, at that time, I was involved mostly with larger features, which back then, sadly, you know, 16, 18-hour days were not unusual. Uh, I think it's getting better, but it's still not much. Still bad. So anyway, but then I got offered another opportunity. So another year went by and I went off and I was doing business consulting. So I had uh, one of the clients that I was working with owned a video house and they did in, um, industrials and um, some local commercials and uh, a couple syndicated shows that they were the videographers and, and editors and they produced those shows. And so they were just not getting anywhere you know a lot of times businesses get to a certain point of success and then they feel like they're treading water and they're not getting anywhere right. and they just... especially if it's a bunch of creatives mm -hmm. just churning through the yeah the art <laughs> not yeah. the business yeah um so so they brought me in to help them and their their accounting system was really antiquated that was one of the issues and so they had difficulty um tracking costs by client and billing by client mm -hmm. And so a friend of mine was working on a, on a, uh, a feature, and I said, well, you know, it's, it's cost accounting, similar to doing a motion picture or television project. Do you think your accountant would show me what software system or what they use to track those costs uh, by project? And I said, I'll, I'll help him out with something in exchange for his time. And she said, well, ask him, I don't know. So he agreed, and I went in, and um, it was a little comical because at that time, uh, everything was done on microdisc, which was a very, very early software. Back in the from day. From Entertainment Partners, back in the day. And um, it was less user-friendly and less accessible than, than other commercial available softwares for small businesses that were out there. So it kind of didn't help me in any way because it, it really wasn't something I could have recommended. Um, but I already offered to help this guy so I still had to do that so I was helping him and he was showing me things and he was going like wow you're picking this up so fast I can't believe how you get this and I'm like um I'm walking in here like I was a controller <laughs> <laughs> I have a little background I'm, <laughs> I'm not like you know the the you know because often in production accounting people get in there um accidentally almost they get into production most accounting. people do accidentally yeah and then apprentice their way up yes and and they either wanted to be an actor or they wanted to be a writer or they wanted to be something and they end up in accounting and then they never leave right it's kind of how that's the story that's the story um and i'm not that i am i am an anomaly in my business you are um, <laughs> So that's who he was used to training, right? Were people who didn't have necessarily a background in finance or bookkeeping. 
uh, much less any sort of college education or business degree. Mm -hmm. That's not generally what was around back then. So he said to me, you should be doing this. You should be doing this. You would be so great at this. And and I was like, well, you know, it might be fun. And again, I had had that previous experience, so I had a little idea of what it was. So a few months later, he called me and said, I'm on location. The, The first assistant that I hired is just not working out. And I told them about you, and I want to bring you out, but they won't pay. <laughs> They'll give you per diem, but they won't pay for any housing, so you're going to have to live with me. I did not know this man very well. Um, but it'll all be great. I'm going to get us a great place, and you know, can you be here in a week? And this is very common in production accounting, as you know. Yeah. Everything is last minute, and you get a job, and you're on an airplane right. you know, often. Can you go now? Now. And I, I said, well, I've got two weeks left with this client that I'm consulting with. You know, I need to finish. And he says, can you finish it in a week? And I said, I'll try. And I somehow managed to do that. And I got on an airplane. And, and it was just this great experience. Wait, where was this job? In Boston. Boston. Yeah. And it was great. But then I got there. And he said, oh, by the way, I kind of oversold you a little <laughs> bit. And they don't know you've never done this before. So keep it so to yourself. Keep it to yourself. If you have questions, you need to wait till it's just the two of us and ask me in private. And now what was the position he hired you for? First assistant accountant. What? Yeah. That was your first job? My first job was as a first. Okay, can you imagine hiring a first that had never done the job no. before? No. You would never. <laughs> Even if they had been a controller, I would never. Yeah, you would never. No, it's just so much to learn. But also, I have to say, this was, um, golly, 25 years ago, and so... They, there were only three of us on a very a pretty large motion picture. There were only three people in the department. It yeah. was before a lot of the governmental regulations right. that required a lot of extra paperwork, and before the studios put a lot of extra, you know, analysis and reporting on accounting. It was a, it was a bit of a simpler time. So you could just pay bills. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so how'd that go? Uh, well, they went great. It. It. I mean, I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> It's stuck. <laughs> it's stuck. I loved the experience, and he was a great mentor and teacher. And Who was it? It was Joe Aguilar. And he was great because he he loved production. Uh, he's now a CEO of an animation facility in China, and he's been very successful. He's been a producer. Yeah. He's been a studio executive. He's been extremely successful, rightfully so, one of the brightest people I know. And I loved, I'm so grateful that he's the first person that I worked with because he said to me, I think there's nothing worse than a stupid accountant. You know, we are not hired to be bean counters. And so you need to learn what it is we do and what these things are for. So, for example, we'd be in the office and I'd just pay some bill for 200 sandbags and and we'd be going to set to deliver per diem or payroll. And he'd say, okay, I want you to notice everywhere you see sandbags today and understand why did we just have to pay for 200 sandbags. And everything was like that. I, you know, I had transportation take me through the equipment. What, what's the difference between, you know, a cube van and a steak bed? What's the difference? What, are the, how what are a they gift. Used? I know. He's the best. Yeah. And so, and I do that today with mm-hmm. my assistants as well, and I encourage them to know what they're paying. You know, even back then it was, of course, all film and all of our equipment was from Panavision on this particular project. And Panavision, I love them, everything had Pana in the name. So there was a Pana Head, a Pana Glide, a Pana This, a Pana That. <laughs> so you'd get this long list of equipment that was Pana, 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 Pana. So I went out one day uh, to set, and I had bills for people to sign off on, and one of them was the camera bill, and a light had broken, and so everybody was sitting around just waiting for them to fix this light. So the camera crew, who almost never have downtime because they're constantly moving, happened to have a little downtime. And so I went to the second AC, and I said, you know, can you can you show me what this stuff is? Because it's the pan, pan, pan. Yeah. <laughs> and, and she did. She took me through. This is the pan ahead, and this is the panic glide, and this is how they work, and this is what they do. Um, and it was great. And that, yeah. I think, is why I still like 
this job because there's always something new to learn. Mm -hmm. There's always the technology changes, the way that we shoot things changes. And then at, at ten years ago in my career, I switched from feature films to television, which are two different worlds. There are a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of things that are very different. And so I'm constantly learning. I'm, it's it's stimulating. It's entertaining to me. I like what we do, and I I think it's all fascinating. So, so yeah, that's how I. Ended wow. up here. And so then he he really wanted to move up. He was very uh, ambitious and very smart, and he wanted to move up to be a production supervisor or UPM. So he kind of, you know, had in his mind of creating in me the accountant for himself, right? Perfect. He would move up, and then I would be his accountant, and that's right. indeed what happened. I was a first assistant only twice, and then seriously, yes, yeah, <laughs> twice, twice. Most people are first assistants. For years. years. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay. Yeah, twice. And then I'm, I, um, uh, actually, we were doing a film for Orion, and it was uh, for Orion, the wonderful Julie Landau, who was the head of finance for Orion, uh, she would hire um, what they called the Orion rep, an accountant who would look out for the studio's uh, well being and work with the accountant. We would do cost reports together. Mm. And so Joe. And Julie decided that they would have me do that on the next project. So mm. that was a blast. So did you have actual accounting duties or were you there like supervising the accounting? No, it's more, it wasn't supervising. It was more a partnership. I, uh, but it was great because as far as, you know, one of the things that, that is negative about our industry is there aren't apprenticeship programs really. Mm -hmm. There's no way to train people to move up. Uh, unless they happen to be lucky enough, as I was, to work with somebody who's willing to train them. It's part of the reason why yeah. I am really adamant about training people and helping people, because I was helped. And thank goodness you are, because there's nothing worse than having, like we have right now, is a shortage of good key accountants, and everyone's scrambling, and it's so important. And I feel very proud. I mean, probably, you know, there are 10 people that I personally helped advance and become accountants who are either some of the best accountants out there or mm -hmm. who are studio executives right now. And I'm yeah. very proud of that because that's be. what we do. You know, we should be we should be creating apprenticeship programs where people can train. And and so in a way, Joe was creating an apprenticeship program for me. Unknowingly, he just wanted it, the show to go well and, and for everything, everybody to be taken care of. But really, he created this apprenticeship program for me because the, the rep would work hand in hand with the accountant on all the cost reporting. Oh, and great. that particular show, had a lot of issues. There were um, 10 different insurance claims, which an insurance claim is an incident where something may happen on set, an actor may get injured, or um, uh, something happens that you have to shut down. Maybe a location isn't available and it's the only thing you had to shoot and you have to shut down for a day and come back to that a different day. And these instances that happened are covered by production insurance and all the costs have to be tracked in a very detailed way yeah. to uh, submit a claim to the insurance company to be reimbursed for. And even 10 of those ten on of a film is fairly um, unusual. Yes, and massive and huge. And, and, and so in addition to that, I also kind of became the person who heralded those, the, the compilation of that data and that everything got booked according and um, that was an amazing education. So I was first assistant twice, and then I was the Orion rep on one film, and then Joe got a job as a UPM, and I became his accountant. And just like that. Just like that, yeah. Um, but again, I emphasize, you know, I, I had a lot of, of bookkeeping experience. I wasn't... You weren't fresh off the bus, right? No, the, the part that I had to learn was that which is unique to to production to to because it's a very weird thing to walk from I always call it I tell people no 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 you don't understand I didn't grow up in production I came from the real world <laughs> <laughs> because there's so much um, first of all there's the attitude in in our industry of we all do whatever it takes to keep the cameras rolling and to get the project in the can whatever it takes, including sacrificing our bodies, mm -hmm. you know, our time, our energy, our, you know, we, we don't get any sleep, you know, you just do whatever it takes. And it's a bit of a disease among all of us. The most <laughs> dedicated type A people in the world. Ever meet. Yes. And even if you're not, you get caught up in the energy of it because everyone else around you expects you to be. I certainly do. I expect people, you know, to just like, well, you know, 
what do you mean you need to go home? This isn't done. What? <laughs> right. <laughs> and I've had to mellow out on that a lot over the years. Um, uh, so that in itself, that's a very different in- environment than most people are used to. Kind of you work the hours on the clock. Right. It's not your job isn't dictated by whatever it takes to get the job done, even if you're there till midnight. There's no clocks in production. Exactly. Yeah. So that's get takes some getting used to. Uh, the many you're bringing together. I always say every day of production that happens is a miracle, mm-hmm. because you are bringing in this incredibly diverse group of people, creative types, numbers types, uh, um, you know, construction types, grips, electricians, camera people, visuals, auditories, kinesthetics, every different actors. kind of yeah, actors, yeah. Uh, it, all these different personalities that could not be more diverse from one another. And yet, somehow, collaboratively, we come together, each of us doing our part, and it happens. Yeah. I, don't, I still don't understand how that happens. <laughs> it's a miracle every day. It is. Every single day is a miracle. Now, explain to me, what's the specific, besides the bookkeeping and the paying the bills, mm-hmm. I know there's a lot more to what the production accountant does. Yes. Explain that piece of... You're really part of the management team. Yes. Of the project. Well, yeah. It, it, um, the production accountant, uh, although we supervise that people get their paychecks and that the bills get paid, we don't really do that. We're we hire uh, a team of, of skilled, competent people who come in and you know a payroll accountant who who submits all of the start paperwork so that people's information is there. Works with our payroll companies to get everybody paid. Uh, the first assistant who is a bit of an office manager, crisis counselor, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it takes to make the day happen, emergency checks, drop everything, get this check ready because if you don't, we'll lose this location. You know, um, this actor's going to walk off the set if we haven't got this to them. You in know, cash. In cash, <laughs> yeah. You know, and just constant um, things like that. So they, they keep the, the day-to-day running and I've of course supervised that uh, and I am the final word and if there's anything that's a drama that they can't deal with of course that comes immediately to me and I deal with it but really my purpose is to first of all to work with the producers in the studio to create a, a workable budget a budget that we can all live with that we can actually produce this project for that amount that is more challenging than most people realize because you're given a script, the producers, the studio are given a script, and we want to make this story. And what often happens in, in these days especially is somebody will say at a studio level, okay, we can do that for $40 million. <laughs> and then only months later is the script and the information given to a producer and an accountant to figure out how. How do we do that? And we often do many scenarios, including going to different cities, which every city, anywhere you're going to shoot has different labor rates, different rates for locations, stages. Every single aspect of the budget pretty much changes every time they say, oh, well, it's too expensive to do in Los Angeles. How about if we do it in Vancouver? (laughs) Oh, well, this actor doesn't want to go to Vancouver. How about if we shoot this in Chicago? You know what? Chicago doesn't have an incentive. How about... Uh, Louisiana or wherever and you end up doing many scenarios often trying to get to a way to make the movie that fits the number that somebody at the studio has in mind just randomly randomly well or you know educated guess right right, let's say based on past experience yes so it's always a puzzle it's a puzzle and you're there are just hundreds and thousands of pieces you're trying to put together and as the accountant I am the one who organizes that into a document called a budget and I don't people say to me well, oh you create budgets I say well no I I assemble budgets hmm. uh, because I could never have all of the information required to create a motion picture budget I need all of those professionals the the wardrobe the department, the camera department. The, I need. They each have to tell me what do they need to do their job. How many people do they need? What kind of equipment do they need? How much do they think they're going to need to spend on this particular type of set that we're doing? So I assemble all of this information and put it into a cohesive document called a budget. 
and um, I have many years of experience, so I can advise about that. Having and again, this is where I go back to my training, where I am, I am not a stupid accountant. I know mm -hmm. what's what. So when departments give me a budget, I know what it takes to do what they do because I've studied it and I've walked through it. And so I'm, it's not as easy to fool me. You can't give me a budget that's really overblown and have me go, oh, okay, let me just type and put that in. <laughs> I'm going to go to the producer and say, you know, I'm looking at this and I'll put this in if this is what you want, but I think this is about 20% heavy. You know, I, you know, I would personally want to know why do we need this and this and this and this. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in most cases, honestly, the producers have already gotten there before me because that is their job. But in some cases, maybe not so much, or maybe they are not looking at it from the exact same perspective I'm looking at. And so my attitude is always, I'm going to give everybody any information or knowledge that I have, but I don't ever make decisions. Mm -hmm. They tell me what they want. Both the studio and the producers are the ones who will ultimately agree on this budget, and I'm creating the budget for them. It's not about me or my ego or what I think I know or what I think I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but by the same token, I don't ever want to not share information that might uh, add to their uh, ability to make a more informed decision, right? So, uh, so that is a big part of the job is is yeah. is creating how we are going to do this thing and that's where it really is management and it is working with the people who um, uh, design if you will how a project goes forward and then as you go you're constantly assessing and reassessing and reestimating and keeping current and giving yeah them the, the information. all the really hard work that my team does paying people paying bills putting purchase orders in knowing who's doing what to whom and getting all that information into our accounting system then allows me to cost report and I take all that great information that they've accumulated and I compare it to the budget and I'm giving constant updates you know and I always say my job is to throw the yellow flag on the field and then my job <laughs> is to throw the red flag on the field but again ultimately I don't make the decisions about how the money is spent I simply am there to provide timely accurate financial information for those who do need to make those decisions um, and that is the key, timely and accurate, that sets apart a good accountant from maybe not so good accountant, is, you know, the last thing any studio or producer wants is, is either to spend more money than they intended unknowingly, or to leave money on the table that could have gone on the screen if they had known it existed. So if you're not giving them timely information, like, you know, on features, it was always the director wants more, right? They want a helicopter for this scene, or they want this huge crane, or they, we, they want 300 more extras. How can we do it? Is there a way we can do it? And so as the accountant, again, I'm trying to get the most timely information. I may be able to say, well, um, you know, this, this equipment that we ordered for this particular scene over here that we shot two days ago came in at half, what we had estimated and so there's ten thousand dollars and you know I just talked to wardrobe and they're finished with this character and there's still this much money left if they don't have that earmarked for somewhere else they need it which is a conversation you mr. producer or ms. producer are gonna have to have with the wardrobe department but if they don't need that that's another pool of money we could possibly tap and it's my job to know where everything is so that I can help to solve that problem so that rather than perhaps make a phone call to the studio where the producer has to say we're going to have to go over budget because the director wants xyz the producer can instead just say yes miss miss, miss director you can have <laughs> you can have that helicopter shot uh, because they know from the information i've provided that there's a way to cover the cost yeah that to me is the most important part of what i do is making sure that that people have the information they need to make good decisions, uh, that they can that they can um, uh, make the best film or television show they possibly can, because that's really the reason we're all there. Right, vitally, vitally important. Yes. Okay. Was there something else you were gonna say about that? Uh, well, the other thing I was just gonna say is that part of that is um, you have to have a certain sense of self and confidence in your knowledge and your ability and not be easily intimidated or afraid. And um, uh, like, <laughs> I was working on one 
really large like action hero type movie and um, the studio and the producers were very concerned about the construction there was a really massive set that we were going to need to build at the end and the vision for it was a bit bigger than the money that we had and we were, we had been kind of told by the um, entire art department well we'll conserve along the way and we'll make sure we can build this set that we want to build so we had our first you know three of say 25 major sets were finished and it was trending over so I sent out again this is my yellow flag right I threw a yellow flag on the hey field now. I sent out a, a memo that said you know uh, here's what was budgeted, here's what the co final costs have come in at, we're trending 10% over, so were this to continue through, you know, the course of our project, we would end up being three or $400,000 over budget in construction. So, you know, the purpose of this is, if somebody needs to make some modifications, now's the time. We've only done three out of 25, yeah. right? So now's the, uh, now is the time. Again, this is a yellow flag. This is a, hey, you can affect change here. You can make a difference. You get to plan. Yeah. How'd that go over? Well, I, I swear, 10 minutes after it went out, the production designer was in my office very angry. <laughs> very, very angry. How dare you speak the truth? <laughs> yes. And, you know, you know, angry. And, again, this is where I say you have to have self-confidence. You have to be sure of yourself and know yourself. Because I could just, I let him be angry. I understood why he was angry. You know, he didn't want, you know, the flaw <laughs> pointed out. He would rather mm -hmm. we just ignore it and he just do what he wants to do and build Fix all these great sets. Uh, because he's an artist and talented and he was building great sets. They were beautiful. But, you know, he, so he ranted at me and, and, you know, but we've told you we're going to cover it and we're going to this and we're going to that. And, we, you know, why did you have to do this? And I just, I listened and I said, you know, this is what my job is. You can tell me all day, but until there is a plan in place to make your thoughts reality, it's still a concern. My job is to let everybody know when there's a problem that needs to be addressed, and that's what I've done. I didn't say, I didn't tell anybody to do anything. I'm just giving them information, I'm giving you information, so that as you go forward, you can make decisions based on the fact of, oh, I still have to make up this money that I overspent on these sets if I want to have money to do that big set at the end. That's my job. So I admire you doing your job. You have to let me do my job. Because a lot of people like to make accounting the bad guy. Oh, sure. Like it's all accounting's fault that yeah. everybody overspent everything. <laughs> I yeah, know. that's my favorite. I know. I'm always saying, please don't shoot the messenger. My job is information. Account, account for what has been spent and to give you information. I don't approve the spending of it. You know, that's the production manager and the producer who approved the spending of it. You hey, know? You're not ordering the lumber. No, no, somebody <laughs> else did that. So, um, yeah. Okay, so, now that we know who you are and what you do, it seems to me, from my limited exposure, that, well, we all know Hollywood is fairly male-dominated, especially on crews, except for hair, makeup, wardrobe, and I think also accounting. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of women in accounting. There are. How has that been for you when really your, in quotes, clients or the people you are gathering information from are your department heads, mostly men, mm -hmm. how have you had to figure out how to communicate and work in that dynamic? Well, uh, figuring out how to work and communicate is, a, is a, I think, a skill anybody in a management position <laughs> <laughs> has to address. There are some people who are naturally good at it. I was not one of them. I tend to be extremely straightforward and forceful. So if I have an opinion, I say it. And um, uh, what I had to learn over the years is that some people can hear it that way mm -hmm. if they're used to that. But if they're not, you better find a way to couch it in a softer tone and perhaps in a different vocabulary that isn't as challenging. Because... A lot, a, a, more so in features, but also in television, you know, these are people with lots of accolades and they have every reason to be very um, uh, proud of themselves and, and a little self-indulgent, if you will. You know, they, they have very high opinions of themselves. <laughs> and so if they perceive you to be challenging them, uh, it's, it's very much the how dare you kind of, yeah. you know. Don't you know who I am? Yes. Look at that, my golden glow. Yes. And that, that can 
fill a room, you yeah. know, if you will. And so it's, for me, I've just found I can be more effective at my job if I read the room, like I read my audience. You know, this person needs uh, a lot of praise and, you know, oh my God, you're so amazing and you're so wonderful, but you know, I have just this little issue. Could you help me with this? <laughs> You know, that uh, yeah. versus there are other people that they really care about their crew. So, for example, I might say, you know, I don't see that we have that much work left on this set. Are we about to lay some, some people off and call it done? Well, that seems perfectly logical from a management point of view. The set is done. You lay people off. That's what we do. They go and they work on another show. Uh, or another set, or somewhere else. But sometimes when you're talking to somebody who who they have a core group of guys that they want to keep working, and they really do have the money, so why are you rocking the boat? Mm -hmm. Are you saying I'm supposed to put my buddy out of work? Right. Right? Right. And that isn't what it meant at all, you know? Um, because I'm not thinking that way because I'm not in that relationship. Right. Right? So I've just learned over the years that uh, rather than you know, kind of come in like a bull in a china shop, I have to, you know, really get to know the people I'm working with, what are their motivations, what is their interest, if you will, in the conversation, and try to accomplish what's best for the production, but without rolling over them, or just creating hard feelings, Yeah, you know? Now that sounds to me like just good management, and how you deal with people in a professional environment where you have to be delicate about all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Has there been an extra layer for you because you're a woman? Well, I think there's an extra layer for every woman in business. Yeah. <laughs> I, I honestly do. Because, especially when you're in a male-dominated business, because there is, everywhere, is, is the, the madman attitudes. Mm -hmm. You know, the, that's the way it used to be. And certainly in our industry, it was very much that way. To, to a certain extent, it still is. They don't always want to hear from women. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, you know, we've all had the circumstance in this business where you say some idea and it gets fluffed aside and then 10 minutes later a guy says it and suddenly it's the best idea in the room. Oh my God, that happened to me last week. Yes, <laughs> happens all <laughs> the time. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that I've learned is that I, I, I kind of play it like this. In, in, if I'm in a very in, in a male-dominated environment where that seems to be occurring, I am a little bit tenacious. So, I start out very gentle, and then I get a little stronger, and then I get a little stronger. And I can, I can man up with the best of them if I have to. But you I don't, consciously ramp it up. Yes. Because sometimes they won't hear you until you behave in a man-like manner. And I have to say, one of my jobs when I was a controller for this small company, the, the man that I worked for, um, all, the, all the store managers were men. And they, it, we put tires on. It was like a tire installation type business. And so he would hear me deal with him, and, and I'd hang up and he'd go, you can't talk to men that way. They just don't hear you. It's like you're the Charlie Brown's teacher, blah, 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 blah. And what way were you talking to them? Professionally. You know, sort of like, um, you know, we're concerned about your, your, you're not meeting your sales quota, and, you know, we suggest you this, or we suggest you that. And he would get on the phone, and I'm not kidding you, he would get on the phone, and I'm not going to use expletives, so where I don't use expletives, you can imagine. <laughs> but You can if you want to. He would say, you know, you, you know, what the hell's wrong with you, you stupid, you know, SOB, you know, I trust you with that place and my sales are going down, like get your head out of your arse and get this thing done and he would scream at them. So that was the better business way to talk to them so they could hear it? That's how they could hear it. Was he suggesting you talk to them that way? Yes. <laughs> yes. And did he, you? Not only did he suggest it, he taught me to do it. And so I would like put on my controller, you know, I'm your boss hat and <laughs> talk to them in, a, in very strong, loud, direct way because he was right. And I noticed the difference almost immediately. And they responded to that. Yes. Which is so counterintuitive to how we're conditioned to deal with men in the workplace. Yes. But maybe in that industry, yeah. you need to talk a little trash. And frankly, in this one, from time to time, too. Oh, for sure. You know, if you're yeah. dealing, there are some, you know, 
some trades in the business where you've got a lot of the kind they they all their whole crew is men they talk men they're just men they're men 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 yeah. and if you walk in like the little lady um, they don't they don't listen to you <laughs> you get nowhere nowhere and so um, you know I always try my best to to be as professional as possible and and I always try my best to be respectful but I'm the type of person that if it doesn't work. I will take a different tact. Mm-hmm. I will. I will go to Plan B. I will be heard. Yeah. Uh, and what I see with a lot of women uh, is they won't. They they don't they, they don't want to rock the boat. You know if they well I said it and they didn't they didn't listen like well you said it but they didn't listen. So but I still want to be again. liked. Yeah exactly. And uh, while we all want to be liked, uh, one of the things when I train people as accountants that I tell them is if you want to be liked you shouldn't be an accountant or a production manager. There, If everybody likes you and you're the production manager or the accountant, you're probably not you know, doing everything you should be doing for your job <laughs> because we have to be able to say no. If you are unable to say no, this is not the profession for you. Right. You know, so I can say no. And, and I feel I have to, you know, my job is, the, the, the money is provided by a financer. Usually that's a studio. I am there to to respect their... Well, respect isn't the right word. I am there to make sure that I am representing their best interests at all times. I have a fiduciary responsibility to account, to spend and account for the money in a way that is in agreement with what we have signed on to do. Mm-hmm. If you come to me and you ask me to do something that is going to maybe be great for you but not for the person who's providing the money I'm gonna say I'm more than happy to do that provided we get the studio on board Mm -hmm. if they agree that this is how we're gonna do this then I'll get that done for you but but barring that agreement no (laughs) no no Uh, I cannot in any good conscience spend other people's money in a way that, that that would not benefit them period so I, you know, I've heard over the years that I have the reputation of being um, a very by the book mm-hmm. kind of accountant, and and I say I love that because the people who want to be a little shady around the edges are never going to hire me, right? And that's great, right? It's funny because <laughs> I've been I've been sitting here trying to okay, how do I bring up your reputation? Because <laughs> you are your reputation is that you're very tough, yeah, um, and you're also very good. Mm-hmm. And I think you have to be both. But let me just say to address yeah. that, yeah, yeah. which is that that's one of the things that if I were a man would not be said about me. I was trying to figure out how to ask that. No, that is absolutely true. I, I get irritated by that sometimes because even when I'm hiring assistants, some of them will say, oh, you know, I hear she's really tough to work for. And I tell people up front, I say, you know, if you like to punch the clock and do just as little as possible to get a paycheck, please don't work with me. Yeah. Because I'm not that gal. I will see your potential. I know what you can do and accomplish, and I will expect you to step up to that. I'm not going to be the person who, you know, says, oh, that's okay. We'll do it for you. Uh-uh. You're not mothering anybody. No, I'm You're not interested. I want to work with strong, intelligent professionals who take pride in their work and who care just as much as I do about doing the best job possible. So if you're not that kind of person, I'm not your gal. <laughs> <laughs> Move right along. Move along for both of our sake, because I'm that's the other thing. I didn't know. I didn't know when I started in this business that uh, people don't fire people. You know, I came. This, let me tell you, in the business that I ran as the controller, we fired people every week. Yeah. We fired people. I went to the the California uh, Employment Development Department hearings on a regular basis to explain why we had fired people and to show the documentation about why they were fired because we were dealing with public safety. Putting tires on cars is a public safety issue and boy, you if can't you screw fight, it up. you can't screw it up. And if you do, I don't really don't have a second chance to give you, mm-hmm. you know? And I won every t- single time I was called in front of the employment development department. Yeah. Um, so I came into this business and it was like, this is a fast moving train man. production just happens. And if you cannot keep up, I got to get somebody who can, because I don't want to do my job and half of yours. So thank you very much, but you got to go. <laughs> Push them off the train. <laughs> off they would go. But I think that's what also works against you because it's yes. moving so fast. You think, oh my God, I don't have the time to train somebody new. So I'll suffer with this person because I don't have time. When you know what? You always have time. You do. Because it's always going to be better. 
It almost always is. I always say I, I really have never regretted having to replace somebody, but I have regretted when I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and it is hard because, it, but you know, my thought about it always is like, I, I know that I'm, uh, I have high standards. And so somebody who is working with me who doesn't share those standards or who, or some people just think I'm obsessive, you know, that they don't, they don't understand why I have high standards. They, <laughs> they think it's overkill. You know what I mean? Oh, she's too, too. And uh, so I always say, if, if, if that's the case and, and uh, you know, I let somebody go, they're going to end up being so much happier because they're going to go find a position where they're working with someone who shares their values. And I'll find someone who shares my values. And then everybody's going to be happier. Yeah. I don't, I don't ever think of it as a negative to let somebody go. I always think of it as, you know, we both get the opportunity to move on and be happier. You know, so I don't understand sometimes when people are like, because again, I don't think a man would be chastised for that, you know, and it's not that I don't do proper no. employee development. I work as hard as I can to teach and teach and teach and teach. But I do. you know what? Third strike, you're out. You can make the same mistake. You know, you make a mistake once, that's a mistake. You make it a second time. Okay. You should have known better. You make it a third time. That, that's you're just not here. You're just not <laughs> you're present. Just, not, just go home. Just go home. We're done with you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for playing. So I really do my best, but but yeah, I think it's I think and I think it's true of a lot of women accountants. There are uh, there are men accountants who I know uh, are much more difficult to work with, uh, who don't take as much, as much mindful care of the people who work with them, who are not in any way called out on it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, because we're women, suddenly, you know, we're, we're, we tell you, it's like, as a woman, you're not allowed to be uh, confident, strong, and, and even arrogant. I'll admit, I'm arrogant at times. I really do know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> but, and if you're not arrogant, you just know what you're doing. Yeah, and, and in a man, those qualities would all be considered uh, um, bonuses. They would be, really leadership skills yes exactly i know it's so funny i have my somebody um i was with my my niece and nephew who have little kids and uh somebody called her daughter bossy mm -hmm. and i immediately turned and said she is not bossy she is showing future management potential yes and i don't want to hear that word used again in this household <laughs> good for you good for you <laughs> because and, I, and the woman looked at me and i said would you ever call her brother bossy and she went, oh, no, I get it. Yeah. You know, but I just, I couldn't let it, you know, it's like, no, that she should be strong. She knows what she's saying, and she said it in a forceful manner, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> and that is always the question. Would you say it to a boy? Would you say it to a man? And I use that in my everyday when I'm sitting down to, to, to think about it, my next job or if, if there's something that needs to be confronting, confronted, excuse me, I will often say, what would a man do? What yeah. would a man do? And if I'm altering my behavior, or I'm not asking for enough money, or I'm not asking for enough assistance, but a man would, I immediately alter it. And I do what I know would be accepted from a man. And maybe that's why people consider me tough. Yeah, well, what a pain in the ass. You're asking for what you deserve. Yeah, imagine. Hmm. <laughs> so do you think you have been paid equitable to the men in your field? Yes. Because, because I demanded it. Yeah, and where I have found that I wasn't, I would go back and, and point that out. And I always feel like, you know, a deal is a deal. If I've agreed to do this project for this rate, that's what we agreed. Uh, but if I then find out that you're paying somebody uh, more for essentially the same job, I'm going to point it out to you. And I'm going to say, you know, you and I need to understand that I'm aware that this is happening. And so the next time we negotiate, please know we're starting there. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's fair. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and again, part of my confidence comes from my many years of experience. The fact that I was trained by somebody who trained me so very well um, that I know I bring greater value than, you know, some of my colleagues may do. So there's a premium for that. Yeah. And, you know, and the other thing is if you don't want to pay it, don't. Someone will. <laughs> right, and then you'll get what you pay for, and, and good I'll luck get what with I that. Yes. Yeah, and then everybody's happy. Exactly. 
Um, now, I also know that you have worked in some environments where there were a lot of badass women running the show. I have. How was that? Oh, I have to tell you, it's awesome. Um, I've worked with... Um, uh, can I say names? Yeah, say it. <laughs> drop names uh, all drop over names. the place. Um, you know, one of the on, on films, one of the best experiences I had was uh, a film that uh, we did for 20th Century Fox. That was the producer was uh, uh, Becky Cross Trujillo, and the production manager was uh, Kathleen Courtney, and myself as the accountant. And we were like the Three Musketeers. We, it was just the most. Um, supportive environment we all clearly understood our roles you know we each knew what each of us was responsible for accomplishing we communicated with each other very effectively if a deal was changed or this happened it went through each of us we all knew what was going on um it was just easy that's the word i would use it was Hmm. easy what about do you think there's a gender piece that made that work so well? Like, how was it different than if you had a mixed management group? Okay, I'm going to be very honest. <laughs> um, I think sometimes our industry is one where people kind of get to positions, and I think there's a little part of most of us who think, why are they trusting me to do this? I'm not really competent to do this. Or I'm not, you know, I just walked in off the street. Imagine how I felt on my, you know, first or second movie. I had never come up through the ranks. I was just an automatic first assistant. You know, must be an imposter. Yes, imposter. That's the right, that's the right thing. So sometimes when you're dealing with people and that perhaps is, is, is in the background of their thoughts and in their level of self-acceptance and, and confidence, People will throw you under the bus, let's be frank. Mm -hmm. They are so nervous about how they're going to get their next job. You know, we're freelance. We're show to show to show. Everybody always has to have in mind um, preserving their reputation to get their next job. I, sadly, have not always had that in mind. I'm always about doing the best job no matter what. Well, you also have these jobs that last 10 years. (laughs) Yes, I have been very fortunate to have some good long series. Um, But so what I've encountered is that sometimes in in a male environment, you're not, they're perhaps not being as forthcoming with information as they might be if they felt entirely confident of themselves. So there's a bit of a, you know, keeping an ace in your back pocket kind of tone to it or sometimes it's a power struggle thing it's like they want to somehow have control over the information and dole it out as they you know want to because they might want to keep this under their you know close to the vest because it's going to affect something over here there's a little bit more um well i wouldn't say more there's there's less trust there's less trust. How exhausting to think that you have to hold it all and then manipulate everything and then somehow you're going to control this whole outcome of this completely uncontrollable yeah. thing. <laughs> like, it, it seems so intuitive yeah. that it would be so much easier if everyone just talked about what was happening. Yes. Well, and again, you know, ours is a very ego-driven business. Yeah. And ego, ego-driven uh, uh, motivations don't lead to collaboration. Um. That's a tweetable. Let's, let's tweet that. <laughs> Say that sentence again. Uh, ego-driven motivation does not lead to collaboration. That was really good. Um, and I think that would probably be the main difference that I experienced both on this feature and then I did uh, was blessed to do five years on Brothers and Sisters, which was uh, an ABC series that was, you know, we had Sarah Kaplan at the helm, who's one of the most brilliant producers I've ever worked with, and I long for the day I get to work with her again. Um, talk about you know three to five steps ahead of everybody at all times. It just was fascinating to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I admire her very much. Uh, Suzanne Geiger, female production manager. Uh, Sally Sue Beisel Lander, who was one of our first ADs. Cynthia Pushek, who was our cinematographer, one of our cinematographers. Um, uh, Denny DeGalli, our production designer. Um, uh, we had we had several female uh, costume designers. Our entire editorial staff, uh, and for at least two seasons, our showrunners were a team of women. 
um, a lot of women in the writers' room. I think Molly Newman was with us every season of that uh, particular show. I mean, just just women everywhere. It was just it's extraordinary. <laughs> Cinematographer really and editors. Yeah, yeah, it's extraordinary. It was great. And our and our our post producer, the head of post production for the show, uh, Nicole uh, Carrasco, was also a woman. I mean, it was just women. Everywhere, and it was the one of the, and I think for everybody on the show, if you talk to the grips, if you talk to you know, just about any department uh, on the show, it was one of the best working environments any of us had ever been in. Hmm. What was so great about it? Well, it's always great for me as the accountant to have a producer or someone at the helm that has a strong hand on the reins. You know, um, you don't, you're never wondering. You know, well, is this being handled or is that? Do mm-hmm. I have to? Am I? You know, should I be saying this? No. Uh, again, uh, Sarah was just on top of everything and knew everything, um, and was very. You know, she didn't hesitate to make decisions. You know, you present her with the information. Here's the pros. Here's the cons. And boom, she had a decision. So she was. We had a strong leader. Uh, from the production side. She worked incredibly collaborative with our creative side, with the writer's room, and we went through different showrunners on different years, and a a lot of, uh, it was a large writing staff because, I mean, we had 13 series regulars on that show. It was huge. It was a lot of people to write for. That's expensive. Yes. (laughs) Um, And she uh, and and our our writers just worked so uh, harmoniously. Um, They were... There wasn't because sometimes on TV there can be a little bit of a a tug between the creative side and the production side. You know, the creative side obviously wants to be creative and do more, and the production side says we'd love to do that, but we don't have the money, and it can start to be a little bit of a power struggle. Uh, but there wasn't any. It was just mm. everybody knew what we were doing. Everybody wanted the best outcome we could possibly have, and they worked cooperatively together to accomplish that. Um, there didn't seem to be, you know, sometimes when you have women in charge, there are occasionally times when some men can be uncomfortable uh, with that. We didn't have any of that. All of the male department heads, our construction coordinator, our grips, our electricians, our set decorator, they all also thrived in this environment. And uh, uh, and worked in that collaborative manner, and where nobody was afraid to say, you know, hey, I think this is a better idea. It might get shut down, but you'd say it. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, why do you think there's so much, such a perception that women can't work together, or it's going to be a backstabbing, catty environment? Because it sounds like that wasn't happening at all. No, not at all. Uh you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know because I, I have not experienced that. I don't create that where I go. In other words, I certainly support and endorse the women that I work with, and and find that they do me as well. So I, I don't, I, I really couldn't speak to that. I don't know where that comes from because it isn't in my reality. I do not feel competitive with the women with whom I work. I feel proud and grateful that we have the opportunity to work together. Are you a success? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you own that right there. Are you a badass? Oh, t- definitely. <laughs> well, you know, you have to understand, I come from an entire clan of badasses. You don't take a Henderson on. You know, let me tell you, if you met my family, you would know exactly where I got it. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's, you know, we say badass. I mean, if you ask me what is my definition of that, I would say extremely self-confident. That to me is badassery, you know, is that you can, you can challenge me. And if I'm wrong, I will also be the first to admit it because then I will have just learned something. Right. Yeah. And then okay. I get, then my badassery grows because right. I now have more knowledge and information than I did before. I made a mistake. Now I'm even more of a badass. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I just tuck that one into my pocket and take it with me for the next one. Jeez. Yeah. Do you have goals that you haven't accomplished yet? Well, I think... I think I have the ultimate goal of every human on the planet, which is balance, right? Mm. Uh, it, it, 
it feels like if you give 100% to your job, then, you know, for some people, their family, their kids may not be getting the attention that they want. I don't have kids, but for me, sometimes it's my health or well-being that I will sacrifice. And, you know, I'll stay and work till midnight when because it has to get done when, you know, perhaps a more balanced person might, you know, check out at 7.30 and go to the gym. Right. Or, <laughs> the um, gym, what's that? Yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I think, you know, a, I think I have a, you have to put it in perspective. You yeah. know, I, I always try to find a greater degree of balance, but what I've learned over the years is that that doesn't exist and that you just have to constantly strive for uh, self-care as best you can, given we work in an environment that is extremely demanding. Yes. What do you think the next steps are for women in this business? Boy, uh, for me, it would be, I think every one of us who is working in this industry successfully owes a debt to the women who are coming up. And, and, and not even women. I mean, I, I've also very much tried to create opportunities for uh, uh, minorities or people who maybe not don't know anybody in the entertainment industry, uh, who are coming in fresh off the boat, if you will, <laughs> or off the street, <laughs> and who don't have any contacts to create an opportunity for them. I've, I've hired some people through the Street Lights program, mm. which is a nonprofit that helps uh, uh, bring people from lower income communities or perhaps of, of diverse ethnic backgrounds uh, and train them to prepare them to come into our, our industry. So first of all, I think we owe a debt to those coming up to train, to to be a mentor, to um, create our own apprenticeship programs. You know, it's, a, it's kind of bad in a way. I understand it, but some of the people that I trained uh, to, to, to move up in the business um, would would volunteer, if you will. They would come in on, they would take a vacation from work or they would take their own time and come into the office that I was working uh, uh, and we would just show them how we did what we did. We'd train them how to use the computer and we'd show them what we did. And, and, and it wasn't so much free labor because obviously when you're training people, it actually slows you down. It doesn't necessarily enhance the thing. But it was a way that they could get training uh, so that they could then actually apply for a job. Mm -hmm. You know, it was in a, in a sense an, an apprenticeship. But now, most places you can't you can't have anybody do that unless you put them on payroll right. because of workers' comp and, 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 and it all, it all labor makes, law. Yeah, it all makes perfect sense, and I and I respect that and I understand it. But in a way, it took a it took a, a, an opportunity away um, f for people who might otherwise get a chance to come in and learn in a in a, in a in just a learning environment where they mm -hmm. weren't under stress to perform because they weren't a paid employee held responsible for, for meeting goals. And then the other thing is just supporting one another. When a woman takes a stand, stand behind her. Don't stand off to the side and observe to wait to see which way the wind blows. Get your ass behind her. You Get know? in the game. Get in the game. And just because, you know, it's very hard to stick your neck out when you're the only lonely. You know, it's hard to stand up. I've been in that position where, you know, Maybe I'm being asked to do something that I am well aware the studio would not be cool with and, or, or certainly wouldn't want done without them being informed. And I've sort of been put in the position of, well, come on, you're one of us. Just, let's just do this. And, you know, you know they'll be happy in the end. Screw and, the studio. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I, you know, and I have to stand because I'm a person of integrity and principle. I have to stand and say... I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I cannot go forward unless we bring them into this conversation. And I'm immovable on that position. And, you know, you, the vibes you get are not pleasant. Well, that could be an unpopular position. <laughs> yes. Um, and I don't, I don't like being in that position. Nobody likes being in that position. But I consider it part of my job duty, mm -hmm. right? That is why I am here, is to protect their financial interest right. and so if I don't stand up if I don't say no if I don't insist that they be, be and, and I, I'm going to tell you honestly every time that that has happened once the studio was brought in everything was great yeah. and we still did it and everybody got to feel like oh, 
you know, everybody's on board. There's no need to constantly look over your shoulder. And so I haven't had any repercussions from taking a stand personally or professionally because it has always worked out for the best. Yeah. So again, I'm a little blessed in there. Cause mm-hmm. I Hashtag blessed. Yes. I haven't had to sacrifice for taking a stand. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really admire people who, who do and who have. And that's why I say we have to, we have, to have each other's back. Yeah. We have to, uh, and I'm not saying, you know, if you don't agree with them, you don't agree with them. That's a whole different perspective. But if you agree with them and there's a part of you that's saying, ooh, but I don't want to say anything because I don't want to be a rebel rouser. Or, that's I don't, so risky. Yeah, it's so risky. I'm afraid I won't get hired or I'm afraid of, you know, this. You no, know, because, if, you know, if somebody's standing out front and then you stand behind them, somebody's going to come stand behind you. Mm-hmm. And somebody's going to stand behind you. And if we make that the norm that we take care of each other, then, then things will shift. And as I said, my experience in working with other women has been just wonderful. I can't, I cannot, you know, think of a situation. I, I've worked with some women sometimes who I think succumbed to the, you mm-hmm. know, boys club mentality and maybe didn't stand behind other women on the production in a way that, that would have been more supportive. I've seen it, uh, but it's rare. Yeah. It's rare for me. I've only seen it a couple of times. Uh, and I've been very lucky to get to work with a lot of amazing, talented, uh, fabulous uh, women, uh, producers, studio execs, um, fellow accountants, um, a- all across the board, production managers. I love working with women production managers. Yeah, well, the women I've met so far in those positions, in order to get to those positions, have to be so capable and smart and confident and by the time they get there they own it that's right they have to be twice as good yeah they really do i'd say even more than twice yeah (laughs) you're probably right yeah yeah and that's very true you know god god bless them let's just get more of us in the room (laughs) thank you so much thank you this is really fun you've been listening to the other 50 percent i'm julie harris walker i'd like to thank ida lee henderson for sharing her story And special thanks to Jonathan Lucas for editing, Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out for added features and bios of our guests. And coming soon, there will be more Tales from the Trenches, this time from Ida Lee. Thanks for listening. See you next time.